Uh, today I'm going to talk about a topic which is uh, quite... Uh, I'm spending a lot of time the last uh, years, the goal oriented semantic communication, which is also... I'll try to give you my vision and give you some first work. But before going into what we can do with that topic and what's the promise, let's see why we probably care about that. And for that, I will make some kind of fast forward to, let's say, 10 years from today and see what the wireless network will have to do. Basically, the wireless network will have to cater to cyber physical or, or some autonomous interactive system, probably with some mission criticality. You can think of applications already today, like swarm robotics, uh, self-driving cars, smart IoT. Um, but then what does this mean? What will it mean for the, for the wireless networks? So then the wireless network, we have to be able to provide a reliable real-time communication, be able to support these autonomous interactions. And in most of these settings, you have to do some kind of actuation or decision-making on a timely manner and ideally automated. And this will also involve some kind of processing either on device in the network. So it's also the computation part that enters into the into the play. So then what happened is that we deviate, let's say, from the classical problem of like, oh, hey, I have a bunch of data, massive amounts of data, and I just need to, you know, process them and transfer on the other side, or let's say put it on the cloud or on the edge, and then I let the, the rest be done by the network. Now we have to, to get data that are generated for a bunch of uh, smart devices, which have some kind of uh, sensing, uh, learning, and processing capabilities, more advanced than the typical sensor that we have today. There are going to be massive amount of these connections. And they should also send information on the other side that will serve a certain uh, task to be done or certain purpose. So the data will be often multimodal. So for example, imagine a car when you have uh, data about some pedestrian detection from radar, leader, or uh, video, for example, and probably high dimension, and it's going to be distributed all over the network. And on the on the top of that, to make things a bit more challenging, we we are going towards applications which like have constraints of being like real time, whatever real time means here. Also, of course, we have to define that energy, and of course, all the security privacy issues. So the big question here is like. Do we know how to do that? Uh, can we be as successful as we were uh, in the past? And do we have actually the right theory? And then we have the theory, then we'll get the algorithms to make it. So let's see what we have been done so far. We go back to the basics, to the foundations, and because virtually all communication systems and networks we're building today are based on Shannon's uh, seminal work. Which, as you know, uh, he said that, you know, the, the communication problem is basically a problem of reliable transfer of information. So I have traffic given by somebody, let's say. I have an information source. Then I have to send it on the other side to the receiver. And I have to reconstruct entirely this information flow uh, as accurately as possible, as exactly as possible. And number two, he said that, you know, the semantic interpretation. So, okay, these messages have some meaning, have some, will have an impact on the behavior of the destination is irrelevant to the problem. And there's a third point as well that normally we forget is that we know, basically, we have code books that they are jointly designed or centrally designed and we both communicate with the same code book, actually. So it means that we have already established some kind of protocol, some kind of communication before starting. This probably would not be the case if you have like autonomous systems or like multi-agent systems. So this drive to the practice, which is basically all this uh, discussion about 4G, 5G, now 5, uh, 6G. And basically we took the theory and we tried to make it uh, into reality. And my claim here is that the way we went so far is what I will call this maximalistic approach. So basically, in terms of the network, we, we are trying to do some kind of over-provisioning. We use, for, for example, some more resources than needed so that we are sure that we can guarantee certain quality of service given some constraints, let's say, on the, on the network concession. And normally, the other thing is like every generation is driven by, by basically inflating the requirements. So let's say, as some people... Uh, say, okay, let's take the previous generation, just put 10 times or 10-fold more, 
and you have your new metrics. So let's say we go for higher frequencies, we go like 10 times more or 100 times more rate, or we go from one millisecond to uh, less, less latency and so on. So my claim here is that probably we go that way. Uh, it's hard to meaningful scale, and especially for a point-to-point -point where we're very close to our fundamental limits. So what we can do actually, and this is where comes this goal-oriented semantic communication that has something to say, I think. So let's kind of abstract a bit or visualize uh, Shannon's model and what basically says that, first of all, it says that I have an information source. So traffic is exogenous. Somebody is giving me the traffic. I don't question how this traffic was generated, who and for what purpose I have to send it. Normally, the communication engineers uh, see things as a, this pipe. You know, I have a pipe which is non-transparent. I don't care what the, what is the content here. I just want to make the fight uh, the the pipe fatter. This is the usual jargon that people are say, are, are using. And data generation is out of the game basically. It's not included, it's not controlled. So I'm given the data, which I, I, I treat them more or less as a sequence of random bits. And then I have some kind of metrics, rate, uh, delay, all this quality of service, which is like a function of all these uh, usual metrics. And my target is to, to basically reconstruct the entire flow uh, in a non causally manner, basically uh, as exactly as possible. Okay. Now, what goal-oriented semantic communication is trying to do it's trying to get this minimalistic approach. So uh, it goes the other way. So like, first of all, we put the data generation into the play. And this is very relevant when we have applications, uh, real-time systems or robots, all these things, which is this sensor, the smart device, let's say, is where traffic is generated. It knows, it observes a certain phenomenon, it takes measurement of a certain phenomenon. So it might have, if it knows what, why it has to send actually these packets at the receiver uh, or through the network, then probably traffic could be generated at will. So for example, if I measure uh, whether a person has, a, has has fever or not, instead of, let's say, taking measurements every, I don't know, with a certain frequency sending on the other side, I could put a threshold and say, okay, I don't send anything till I see that the temperature is above 38. And then I generate traffic because this is what the other person is looking for. So if we want to take into account the, the variability of the source and the process, then already we have that the sensor has to do some kind of active sampling. Then all these uh, packets that will be generated, of course, they will, might have to have some filtering or some processing, and they will go all the way to the receiver and even how important it's known has to say things, for example, has to be done in, in filter also in the in the physical layer and the medium access layer. So, and the key to do that is by capturing the information attributes, the semantics of information, which in my definition, it will be basically the significance and the effectiveness with respect to a certain goal of the data exchange. Now, what also changed also is that the reconstruction that I want on the other side, which could be uh, used for some kind of actuation, I might have to do some kind of causal reconstruction. So something that normally we don't know how to do is very complicated, let's say the analytical tools we have. And also I might not even need to, to reconstruct the entire flow basically. I also need to do some kind of fast reconstruction or some kind of approximate result. We change the way actually we have to do it. And what is more here is that there are many scenarios, especially when we put time into to play, something that is not always a good friend with information theory, is that we show that this is a non-separable approach. So basically, we have to jointly design the data generation, the information transmission, and the source reconstruction. So there's already a very challenging theoretical problem here. Now, uh, when everybody starts, you know, about the semantic communication and, you know, we have started a few years ago, but now many people are jumping into, into the topic. There is a key problem that we have to solve. And as long as we don't solve that, uh, let's say we might not progress as much as we want. So we want to say, okay, the semantics of information will capture the significance. And significance is, okay, it has double meaning. It's not mostly the meaning for me. It's the importance or the effectiveness of the information. So I'm saying the information will change the behavior of the observer or some kind of decision-making actuation uh, he or she does. So 
I want then to put some disparity between outcomes. There are events, there are outcomes, because also you can see that's an event-based communication. There are outcomes that are more important from an application and user point of view uh, than uh, from uh, the um, treating it as, uh, as usual. For example, I might have two events that are of low probability, so there's a lot of uncertainty, but it might not have the same effect. For example, uh, the fact that it's going to have snow in the Sahara Desert versus the fact that it's going to be a, a thunderstorm next to your place. From the observer point of view, the first one could be, okay, interesting information, surprising, and you know, with surprise, we learn more things. But on the second thing, you might also go back to your place and you know, protect certain things. So it has an effect on the thing. So the problem here is that we need to put in this quantitative approach that Shannon had in the tropic metrics, which is basically, uh, we care about the probability of occurrence. We have to put some kind of uh, value of these events with respect to the goal or say the application. So basically we need to have concrete metrics of quantifying and characterize the importance, what people say with semantics. And if we don't have uh, metrics that they are amenable to analysis, we can work and give insights, then the discussion will become a bit, uh, you know, into the high level on philosophical. Now, one, one, one direction to go is trying to, you know, using the uh, entropic framework and come up with some kind of generalized entropic uh, metrics. There is, this includes as well the, the thing of the weighted entropy that has been done in the past. Of course, if we try to generalize and capture the importance through some kind of generalized functions for the entropy, we also have to pay attention whether this is kind of a, a real metric of the tropic way. So we have to, to satisfy the axiomatic formulation. We go uh, away from the additivity. So this has some implication on the decision we're making. And most of it not have an operation meaning. But still, there are some ways to work and then basically what is going to happen is that you're going to have the source that might have some kind with the entropy uh, you're going to get the quantitative aspect so as as usual but then you might have some kind of uh, another metric another entropic metric which captured basically the semantic value and then you can go and solve again uh, either maximizing whether you have a channel or not maximizing the capacity through some kind of distortion that you have on the semantic basically metric or you can also do some kind of noiseless case with uh, ray distortion now this some first tries show that uh if for example the 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 weight i put on this uh approach uh when when i when i use the entropy and so on it has i want to keep this additivity and so on it turns out that okay it changes a bit the coding schemes but they're not surprisingly different. I mean, so different from Shannon Coach. So let's say then we might do all that stuff, but basically from a communication perspective, we don't change the way uh, we design things. We don't gain that much for the moment. And also there's very challenging with this entropic uh, kind of approach, which is, uh, first of all, it averages the identity. So we're not sensitive to some kind of uh, non-stationarity. We might also see things on a local stationarity, but then, uh, overall we don't capture and also here we're given the distribution normally this is what we do we have the distribution there is the probability of a certain event and they don't change over time time is not here and we don't capture let's say instantaneous signal changes and so on and not to mention also the context so there is a lot of work to be done here um but i think if we don't have concrete metrics we're not going to go very far now what we can do today though we can uh, have some metrics uh, uh, inspired by basically all these emerging field of, I mean, now it's a kind of comfort uh, zone. A second, sorry, uh, of uh, age of information, and we can say, okay, information has some attributes, and the attributes could be also some kind of innate or intrinsic, some objective ones. For example, freshness. So when the information has been generated and when it has been received, received. The precision I make on the measurement, the accuracy I will describe a certain phenomenon and so on. And also you can have some attributes that are contextual. For example, information that is sampled, let's say now, and I'm sending on the other side, it could arrive 
after all this network congestion and the processing delays, you can arrive at a certain point of time there. Uh, whether it's the right point to make the decision, it was late or not, it defines the timeliness. And this depends on the context. For example, if the message is like, okay, you need to break and we send that to a car. If it arrives on a certain window, this is the critical window it has to arrive. If it arrives later, probably has catastrophic events. So then non-timely information could have also catastrophic events, but depends on the context. Could be also applications that are delay tolerant, okay? And the complete and so on. Now, on the top of that, we have also, because this is kind of very nuclear way of seeing things, we also have some kind of perceptual quality of the information, some kind of how we perceive, let's say, even images that we can have like uh, low distortion images, but then from a perceptual point of view, they might not look natural and so on. So in the whole framework of going about describing the attributes of information, we can also add a new dimension about if the the source has some kind of distribution. And at the end, what I want to reconstruct on the other side is actually the distribution of the estimation that I have after all this process in compression and so on. And a way to capture that kind of quality among distributions, of course, a natural way is divergences or some distance function, whether it was a Stein or if divergence is somewhere. If we put all that together, we can have a metric, which we can call, let's say, semantics of information, which is basically I have a certain function that acts on the uh, attributes of the information. And of course, I can also put an extra function as a composite thing, which captures the context or the cost I have to generate information. So to give you a very simple example, take that you have, for example, uh, as, a, as, a, as an intrinsic attribute, the freshness. So basically, the time difference between when the packet has been received minus when the packet has been sampled, has been generated. I can get the distortion as well between, I mean, it's quadratic loss here, between basically the uh, the state of the source or the, the value that the source represents. And then I can mix them in a kind of multiplicative way. And then I can take the timeliness function, which is I'm defined with these things. So as long as I receive, I don't know if you see my point, as long as you receive the information within this time horizon, then your utility function basically remains the same, and then it's exponentially decreasing. And we can solve a lot of examples like this. And you can see that this definition goes beyond basically all this age of information, value information, or call information, and basically treat them as uh, special cases. Now, what we can do, let's say, I'll give you an example of what we can do with that. Let's take a simple example of, let's say, timely, or like, if you want, call it semantic source coding. So I have a source, I have events, basically, uh, uh, discrete symbols are generated, and I know the PMF, the probability of realization. Okay, I can even rank them, let's say, in terms of probability. And then what I'm trying to do, I'm, go I'm gonna send this information into a monitor that wants to have also to make some kind of timely decision, you also have like fresh information, okay? <clears throat> so I have an information show that generates status updates and I'm pushing them to the, that's the person I'm pushing them to the monitor, okay? Now, I would say that, you know, not a realization, for example, are important for me. So I can place myself where a very simple naive case where the importance captured by, it's a function of the probability of occurrence. So let's say, suppose I'm, I'm, I'm having a monitor that cares about alarm modes. I'm caring about rare events. So an event that has low probability is probably an event which is more important than me and the other ones is not, okay? So what I'm gonna do, for example, here as a very, very simple semantic filtering kind of uh, selection, then I'm gonna say, okay, from the end realization, I might take the, say, the K most or least probable realization and the remain ones, I will just discard them, okay? Then I will have to encode to the packets and I have to basically find the code word length so that I have an objective, which is a certain utility function on the monitor that I want to maximize or minimize, okay? Now, to keep things simple, we assume that the sequence of abbreviation IID and Poisson arrivals and, you know, error-free channel. This is a very, very first example to, to, to show you. So as an objective function, utility function, we can put, for example, of non-linear H, which is the timeliness, so a non-increasing utility function G of the age of information, okay, delta, which I repeat is basically the difference between the time I received the packet minus the uh, when it was sampled, when it was generated. And then I will take basically the average, let's call it uh, 
semantic of information function, okay, which of course I can calculate based on this uh, here for an ex exponential, let's say G is an exponential function. I can find these kind of areas here to calculate based on the waiting time, service time. I can do all the analysis that I can do with like kind of nonlinear age here. And then, as I said, my goal is to find, let's say, the optimal under, uh, uh, I'll say why here I have these, uh, uh, how to say, <laughs> put it on uh, in brackets, the code word length that optimize, let's say, a weighted sum of the average semantic information. And I can even put, put a cost function on the average length. And the cost function I'm going to use here actually is uh, what we call a quasi arithmetic. Now, for simplicity of solving this optimization problem, I will turn it into, instead of maximizing the average uh, semantic information, I will minimize, let's say, the penalty of being late. Okay, it makes uh, the analysis a bit simpler. So basically, I would like to find the optimal LI, the optimal cover length of this uh, utility function, okay, which you can go further and further. It's a weighted sum between this function and some kind of quadratic cost function on the quadward length. You can have it or you can get rid of it. It's just uh, uh, an extra addition. If you want basically to go beyond Huffman coding, let's say, and have to put some, some kind of uh, cost in the way of like longer or shorter code words are penalized more or less, depending on what you want to do. This is a kind of a processing cost. Of course, this I have, since I have to have a uniquely decodable code, I have to have the constraint on the craft inequality. And of course, it's an integer constraint that makes our life a bit difficult to solve this optimization problem. So then I'm going to go and do some kind of relaxation and I'm going to consider real values, non negative real values for the goodness. That's why it's not exactly the optimal. Of course, I could do some kind of uh, ceiling operation. I'm done. So we can solve this problem analytically. So we, we, we solve it and you can get the LI as a kind of a complicated expression with. Uh, some number functions and so on. Uh, this is not, I think, the interesting part. What we can learn about this. For example, you'll see here I have a source, which is basically, uh, it follows a zip, zip distribution. So then I can go from some uniform source to a very picky one, depending on this parameter S here. I have 100 uh, events, basically, and it's 100. And I see that in order, basically, to minimize my utility function, okay, this weighted sum, there is an optimal number of uh, packets I should select, OK? So let's say, instead of sending 100 when I have an arrival of lambda 0, 5, then basically, with 10 packets, I'm doing my job, basically, at the monitor, OK? When, of course, the traffic is uh, heavier, like lambda is 20, I can even, even shrink them. Basically, I can even send, instead of sending all these 100 realizations, I will see, I will just send like 5 or 10 of them. And this will optimize basically my goal capture by the utility function. And you will see um, I can do the other way of like finding for different kind of truncation I'm doing basically different kind of filtering, whether I take the tenth or the half of the uh, uh, of the uh, realizations. What is the optimal traffic I could support to minimize my objective function? Okay, so we can we can basically. What we are doing here, we want to solve this timely source coding problem, or let's say semantic coding problem. I could basically not send all the packets, just the old way, uh, the, the way I was doing it, just like sending packets and um, let the application, let, let the receiver go in all the way up to the application, say whether they are relevant or not. Here, I'm filtering, I'm sending only the packets that have an effect, basically. And I save, of course, resources, sending in energy and so on and so on. So this is a very simple example, which can be generalized in a multi-user system. We did that. And also with system where the monitors, when I'm sending there, have to code the, the packets, but they have monitors that have heterogeneous goals, for example. So some monitors are interested about the most rare events and the other for the most frequent and so on. It gets the analysis a bit more complicated. Uh, I can give you the reference even on the journal paper for those who are interested. And we can do the things, and we can even go better on the, the semantic filtering, because when I have a multi-source uh, problem here, I can also do some kind of information fusion. So I can go beyond some additive, let's say, uh, metrics to try to get the, the fusion uh, part. So we can even elaborate 
effect on the filtering uh, or the encoding part. So in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go to, to the next problem that you can show. And since also the, the, the workshop, I think, focus not only on performance guarantees, but also on time and real time, um, these are also uh, ideas that they can uh, do a lot on problems of real time tracking and remote reconstruction of basically Markov sources. So here I'll show the simple example, which we have extended to an end state Markov state. So suppose that I have a two state Markov source, okay, with two kind of states. For example, so it could be a robotic arm, which basically I need to sample, send it over a wireless channel, reconstruct it on the other side. So then I have also an actuation based on that. For example, whatever I'm doing here at the, at the, at the, at the transmitter, I want to reproduce it at the receiver because there's a robot that remotely I'm, I'm trying to manipulate or so on. So what I'm trying to do is basically I'm trying to optimize the real-time actuation at the receiver time. So for example, the way to do that is instead of going for the typical average metrics, I want to minimize the real-time reconstruction error. So I want basically to have the same kind of state both at the transmitter and the receiver. So they should not have errors because if I have errors, then this will have a penalty on the actuation error. And I might have also non-commutative errors, which means like it's very missing, let's say, being on state zero at the transmitter and at the, at the receiver I'm, I'm state one, for example, could be more catastrophic or have more consequences or costs uh, with respect to the other. The typical example will be if I confuse a, a red light, traffic light as a green, and then I accelerate, I might cause an accident versus, for example, green as, as red, and then I just break and I bend the others. So we can play a lot of tricks here and have some kind of joint um, joint way of, um, there, there was a question in the chat, just a second. Yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, a way to basically solve that uh, in the end state as well is very, very interesting because I have to analyze joint data sampling and transmission techniques. And uh, without going to the details, I'm going to send you how, how it performs. So if I have a policy which takes into account, let's say, the discrepancy between the state on the source and the destination, and I'm optimizing and I'm sampling based on that, and I can analytically do with Markov chains, uh, and it's very beautiful, the analysis, actually, you'll see how, how much I can, with the semantics of where, let's say, the purple thing, how much I can drop the real-time reconstruction error depending on the success probability I have on the channel and the cost of actuation as compared to doing uniform sampling or minimizing the age of information and so on. And what is most important, most of the times I don't send unnecessary packets. So basically the samples I'm sending, which has no effect on what I'm trying to do, the non-informative ones are less than 1%. So I'm not sending information for nothing. That's basically, if you want, the baseline. Now, since I have a less than almost like 10 minutes. Let's go to some other direction when it has less of a time, but it's also more uh, theoretically uh, intriguing. So what at the end I'm trying to do, in the past, I have this typical thing. I have a source, I'm encoding it, I'm sending it, and I'm reconstructing whether I have a channel or not. It depends on what kind of showing. Now, we can see that the what I'm trying to send on the other side, there is a source, a semantic source, can have like kind of multidimensional uh, distribution, which I might not have full access, or I might get some noise observation, okay, which I want to do on the other side. I also want to have two kind of metrics. The one that I have to have on the observations, on the samples I'm getting from the semantic source to have a very good re uh, reconstruction, okay, on the samples. But also, I want basically to recover what the semantic source, the remote source is, is, is trying to say. So this and we saw it with rate distortion. So we can ex extend the rate distortion, adding a second constraint. This is known. This is a remote source coding problem with two constraints. And on the top of that, I can put some kind of the semantic quality measurement, say the divergence, which make the problem extremely challenging. But actually, we are uh, having some first result, which is quite promising. Now, what we do here, we think that this is a nice framework to model what we call this goal-oriented semantic communication. So basically here I have a source, okay, which might have 
uh, some kind of semantic information or nutrition information which I don't have full access, this X. And basically, I'm taking noise observation of the source and the encoder side, OK? And I have these uh, basically transition probabilities here. This is the Z which normally I communicate. I encode. I'm sending with a given rate. I, I have a decoder. We have also two kind of uh, criteria, two kind of distortion metrics. One on the observations and the other on the semantic source, basically. Okay. So I have two distortion functions. And of course, I'm doing the classical way for the moment, these average principle distortions. We recently extended and submitted the version on uh, F separable distortions, which is extremely more uh, uh, challenging, but more interesting. So what I'm trying to do is like, what is the role of this fidelity criterion in this kind of problem where I have remorse source coding problem with individual distortion measures, okay? So we managed to basically characterize this, what we call semantic rate distortion function, okay? So for a given uh, P of X, X is the, the I repeat, is the observation. And the PZ given X, which is basically the transition from the semantic source to the um, to the observations, I have this uh, semantic rate distortion function, which actually is a special case of the multiple description problem for those who are or robust description problem for those who are familiar with. So we characterize the functional properties. Uh, so we have a, a nice characterization of the rate distortion function here, and we found actually also for this radius source function two bounds. We work on finite alphabets and then we extend it for Gaussian sources, where basically we show that this function is lower bounded by the direct ray distortion problem with an IID source Z, okay, as if I didn't have the remote part, and is upper bounded basically by the indirect ray distortion problem, the remote source with the remote source X and noise observation Z. Okay. So this is a general uh uh, general result when when we have this kind of Markov uh, Markov change here, we can show that it's tight actually the lower bound or the upper bound, and this allows us to have a very general result, uh, which I cannot detail uh, now for the parametric solution of that, which also help us to pr propose and generalize black hole remote to also compute that things. Now, what does it mean in practice, let's say? Let's get the simple example of bi binary alphabet. So I have an improbable semantic remote source, a Bernoulli basic one half, and I have a symmetric channel with uh, that crossover pro uh, probability. Then, basically, the um, semantic rate distortion function with uh, the optimal one is basically the max of these two expressions. Okay, which, what does it mean? It means that when the, dis the, the distortion constraint on the observation is greater than this ratio, which takes basically the distortion of the semantic source and the crossover probability, then I just need to encode only the semantic information. Okay, I don't need to care about the uh, observations part. When it's lower than that, basically it's beneficial to encode the observable method subject to distortion and not care basically about the semantic part, if you want to say it like that. And of course, when it's equal, Encoding either of the two does not offer any advantage. Okay, now since I have like maybe five minutes or something like that, according to my clock, I'm going, I'm deviating from the results. I'm going to see you the bigger picture because these are first tries to try to, let's say, scratch the surface of the problem. The bigger problem, and this is very intriguing and opens a new kind of direction, is that at the end of the day, I have some kind of complex data. We have like also structured topological properties. It could be also line on high, high dimensional space, which basically I need to communicate and generate on the other side. Of course, in the past, we, we know to do it for simple sources or Gaussian sources. We know how to do it optimal. But if we have to basically uh, communicate, let's say, um, information line on high dimensional spaces, uh, maybe the way we do it today is not the, 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 the right one. And this also has a nice interplay with all these uh, generative models from machine learning, as is the theoretical part. Or you can see it also some an extension of a ray distortion uh, perception problem with kind of uh, information bottleneck problem. But what I find more interesting is that at the end of the day, is not only to get samples, like get samples from that uh, source, sending you know, the optimal way the other side and reconstruct them, but also you need to have some kind of divergence between this P of X and the P, of, P hat of X. So this is, is similar to what people in, let's say, multi-cellular are doing like domain adaptation kind of thing. 
And this is actually, and there is a connection between, this is the information theoretic equivalence between ray distortion and optimal transport is like, this enriched the communication problem, which is basically an optimal transport problem. Because at the end of the day, uh, what I'm trying to do is communicate basically high dimensional uh, data coming from multiple sources and also information that could lie in certain information space. This is a non-trivial extension of the existing information theoretic framework. Um, and there's a lot of interesting mathematical problems to solve here. Not to mention that this is kind of the point point picture what I'm showing here. Then we have to see uh, how this scale or how this behave on a large scale network actually. And there's even more intriguing actually uh, taking the spatial uh, geometry here. Um, since I have to resume basically in two minutes, I uh, have only two slides, but I will conceptualize because I want to give that message. Then we have all this discussion about semantic information, importance information, and so on. What I finally, I, I, I realize and more and more, and I'm trying to work a bit slow though, is that um, the timing is, is a key way of capturing basically all the notions of context, dependent significance in different scenarios. And even if you want to go further, basically, get inspired by the definition of time from physics and try to say that basically, at the end of the day, what is my problem? I have an event generate on a certain point in space at a given time, T1, let's say that that's the physical world. I have to send it on some kind of virtual world, let's say, on a given, on a different kind of uh, point in space, a different time. I could do my fundamental limits on the compression, on the time duration, I have to say that I can abstract, let's say, all these uh, network, basically, uh, details, physically, and so on, in some fundamental limits. But at the end, what I want is basically, I want, given a certain reference frame, to have the two ends synchronized. So I want that what I see uh, on the point A and the point B, they're kind of synchronized or aligned. There's the least mismatch on the things, and there's kind of synchronicity. So this brings the notion of basically restoring some kind of symmetry with respect basically to the reference frames when information evolves actually, because you can also have the two ends evolving for different reasons on a different time. So using some kind of, let's say, um, information geometry and basically similarity geometry, we can kind of mimic this twin paradox, which basically I'm trying to uh, align uh, these two ends Get, getting read or uh, let's say transform getting the typical thing as, as like Poincare Lorentz transformations to capture this time dilation that I might have the same way I have in relativity and so on. So we're not doing relativity here, of course. What we're doing is we're taking ideas and the mathematical framework here. And actually, you can put you play nice games of uh, even putting the notion of curvature here. This is ongoing work. So to summarize, um, basically. What I'm trying to do, maybe a bit in a very compressed way and a very fast pace, I'm trying to, to, to persuade you that there's an emerging paradigm, this goal-oriented semantic communication, which kind of redefines the effectiveness and the timing. And this is, I think, the key kind of theory that will allow us to basically uh, make into reality all these autonomous real-time systems. They are very, very intriguing theoretical problems, which is actually it's not like going beyond Shannon, as some people say. It's just like augmenting the Shannon's paradigm with some kind of um, uh, what we want today. And there's a bunch of actually of applications that we can uh, think of if we manage to solve all these challenging uh, theoretical problems, which are so. We have started some of them, but there's a lot of work to be done. So thank you very much for for uh, the attendance. If you have questions, I'm free. Now we'll just acknowledge the uh, ERC funding because this comes from uh, my consolidator grant uh, Sonat. Thank you very much.